As we pull up to the remote cabin, a surge of relief washes over me. After hours of driving, the sight of our destination feels almost surreal. The cabin stands proudly, a rustic wooden structure with a hint of age to it, nestled amidst a grove of tall, majestic pine trees. Its wooden panels, aged by the seasons, are a mix of deep browns and grays, with hints of green moss near the base, giving it a sense of belonging to the landscape. The cabin is two stories high, with a slanted roof that's covered in a thick layer of pine needles from the towering trees overhead. A stone chimney rises from one side, promising cozy fires on chilly nights. Windows with deep wooden frames look out from the cabin, some adorned with simple white curtains that wave slightly from the gentle breeze. The sun, now in its descent, filters through the dense foliage, casting dappled light upon the cabin, making the grain in the wood seem more pronounced. The surrounding area is clear, giving way to a view of the forest beyond, with wildflowers dotting the landscape. A wooden porch wraps around a part of the cabin, furnished with rocking chairs. As I step out of the car, the air hits me. It's pure, cool, and invigorating. The dominating scent is that of pine, but beneath it there's the unmistakable smell of earth and hints of wildflowers. The gentle sound of wind rustling through the leaves completes the serene ambiance. This cabin, with its perfect blend of rugged charm and natural beauty, promises a break from our chaotic city life, and I'm wholeheartedly ready to embrace it. Dad, can I go explore? My younger son Lucas asks eagerly. His eyes, reflecting the brilliant colors of the forest around us, are wide with anticipation. Beside him, his older sister Mia stands with one hand shading her eyes, already scanning the dense tree line of the woods. The mischievous glint in her eyes suggests she's ready to dive into whatever secrets the forest holds. After we unpack, I reply, trying to instill a touch of patience into the children's bubbling enthusiasm. I glance over at my wife Lisa, expecting her to back me up, but she's engrossed, her eyes lingering fondly on the rustic charm of the cabin. She turns to me, her lips curling into a gentle smile. It's perfect, she says, her fingers intertwining with mine in a reassuring grip. It's exactly what we needed. As the day unfolds, the kids' curiosity proves unstoppable. Once the luggage is stowed away inside the cabin, they drag us into the wild embrace of nature. Lucas, with his sharp eyes and keen sense of observation, stumbles upon a hidden treasure, a small stream that meanders through a patch of the woods. The waters are so crystal clear that you can see the smooth pebbles and curious little fish darting about at the bottom. Laughter fills the air as we splash around. Mia has different priorities. With a determination that's both adorable and impressive, she takes charge of gathering materials for the evening. She's on a mission, collecting an array of twigs, fallen branches, and the perfectly shaped pine cones scattered around. She declares that they'll be perfect kindling for the fireplace, and her face is illuminated with pride at her contribution to our evening's warmth and comfort. The promise of a cozy night ahead, surrounded by the warmth of the fire and the love of family, fills us all with a contented joy. As the sun dips below the horizon, casting the woods in a soft twilight glow, we find ourselves comfortably settled in the cabin. The wooden walls, aged by time and weather, emanate a warm, earthy aroma that brings to mind memories of past woodland retreats. Knots in the wood grain and the occasional creak of the floorboards underfoot add to the cabin's rustic charm. The heart of the cabin, the fireplace, comes alive with a spirited blaze. The crackling of the burning logs is a comforting sound, with flames that dance and leap, casting a warm golden hue around the room. For dinner, we opt for simplicity. Sandwiches filled with fresh ingredients and glasses of chilled juice. Yet in this environment, even this basic meal feels like a feast. The ambiance, the warmth, and the company elevate the experience, making it memorable. With the darkness deepening outside, Lisa and I guide the children to their bedroom. The room, dimly lit by a bedside lamp, is filled with the soft sounds of whispered secrets between Lucas and Mia. They share giggles and hushed tales of the day's adventures, their voices dripping with innocence and joy. The sight warms my heart, a reminder of the simple joys of family. Assured that they're safely tucked in, Lisa and I retreat to the porch. The night is cool, prompting us to wrap ourselves in thick, cozy blankets. 
The vast expanse of the night sky stretches above us, dotted with countless stars, some twinkling, others shining with a steady glow. The universe seems to spread infinitely, and the beauty of it all leaves us in awe. Lisa's head finds a resting place on my shoulder, her hair brushing against my neck. It's so peaceful here, she murmurs. I find myself nodding in agreement, taking a moment to absorb the stillness of the night, the chirping of the crickets, and the distant hoot of an owl. I give her hand a gentle squeeze, reaffirming our shared sentiment. This is exactly what we needed, I respond, gratitude evident in my voice. Then suddenly an unnerving sound originating from above slices through the otherwise tranquil atmosphere, causing both Lisa and I to jolt upright. The noise is unmistakable, a thudding that resembles the pacing of footsteps on the cabin's wooden roof. Lisa's fingers clamp tightly around my arm, her nails digging in slightly. Her eyes are wide with a mix of fear and confusion and search mine for answers. What is that? she asks, her voice a mere whisper choked with anxiety. I'm not sure, I admit, forcing a steadiness into my voice that I don't truly feel. Could be small animals playing around, I suggest, hopefully, clinging to any logical explanation that comes to mind. However, even as the words leave my mouth, doubt settles in. The thuds are far too heavy and too deliberate to be dismissed as the antics of small woodland creatures. Then another set of footsteps joins the first. Suddenly, the door to the children's room slams open, causing us both to startle. Lucas and Mia, eyes wide and reflecting their fear, dash out. Their usual playful and confident demeanor is nowhere to be seen, replaced by sheer panic. Daddy, what's that noise? Lucas manages to whisper, his small frame trembling as he looks up at me. I kneel down, wrapping an arm around Lucas, trying to project a sense of security. Probably just animals, bud, I say, hoping to reassure him. Mia isn't as easily comforted. She shoots me a skeptical look, her eyebrows furrowing in doubt. They don't sound like animals, she declares, her tone firm, revealing an edge of growing fear and unease. Lisa, trying her best to maintain a facade of composure, casts a glance at the kids. Let's all stay in the living room tonight, she proposes. The strain is evident in her eyes, despite the calmness she forces into her voice. It might just be the unfamiliar sounds of the woods playing tricks on our minds. We'll be okay if we stick together. Noting an agreement, I help rearrange the couch cushions and blankets, creating a makeshift bed. The children settle in between Lisa and me. The eerie footsteps persist, fading in and out but never entirely ceasing. Each thud resonates with a heaviness, echoing within the confines of the room and sending involuntary shivers down my spine. The weight of the situation, coupled with the exhaustion of the day, slowly nudges us toward sleep. But it isn't the peaceful slumber we had hoped for. Instead, it's a fitful, shallow rest, punctuated by vivid and unsettling dreams that blur the line between reality and the dream world. A soft, distressed cry from Mia jolts me awake. My eyes snap open, trying to adjust to the darkness that engulfs the room. The fire from earlier has died down to mere embers, casting a faint, reddish glow. All I can discern are the silhouettes of my family and the steady rise and fall of their chests. The haunting footsteps that interrupted our night have stopped. An uneasy silence reigns, broken only by the distant sounds of the forest night. Despite the stillness, an intangible heaviness hangs in the air, a residue of the night's unexplained events. The dream of a restful and rejuvenating vacation now feels distant, overshadowed by the mysteries of the night and the unanswered questions they bring. Eventually, the pale light of dawn filters through the cabin's windows, casting a soft, golden glow on everything it touches. Birds chirp merrily outside, and the world seems to come alive. But the beauty of the morning feels somewhat muted, overshadowed by the mysteries of the previous night. The memories of those eerie footsteps remain vivid in our minds, and breakfast is a quiet affair, punctuated by shared glances and hesitations. Over buttered toast and freshly brewed coffee, the topic we've all been avoiding finally comes up. Lucas, with his voice hesitant, asks, Do you think it was just animals on the roof? Mia points out the inconsistency of such heavy footsteps belonging to woodland creatures. Lisa recounts some stories she has heard about old cabins settling and making noises. 
Each theory is presented, dissected, and then set aside as none seem to fully capture the strange nature of the sounds. Determined to keep a positive outlook, I break the silence. We came here for a peaceful getaway, and we won't let one odd night define our trip, I say, with more conviction than I feel. But deep down a feeling of unease gnaws at me. Lucas and Mia exchange glances, and while they nod in agreement, their apprehension is evident. They have always looked up to me for reassurance, but I can see the trust weaken slightly, replaced by concern. Lisa offers a smile, albeit a hesitant one. As the day progresses, we immerse ourselves in activities to keep our minds off the previous night. We hike, fish by the stream, and even have an impromptu picnic. Yet, despite our best efforts, an undercurrent of anxiety remains. Shadows seem to stretch longer, and every rustle in the underbrush is met with heightened alertness. The descent of dusk is both beautiful and ominous. The sky, painted in hues of pink, orange, and purple, is a signal's the approach of another night, and with it the memories of the unsettling sounds come rushing back. As the world outside grows darker and the sounds of the forest come alive, an almost tangible tension fills the cabin, thick and oppressive, as we brace ourselves for what the night might bring. As darkness takes hold, the ambient sounds of the forest amplify, but among the familiar there's a strange and haunting silence. No sooner than we settle down for the evening, a faint tapping sound emerges. At first it seems to be coming from a distance, like a gentle knock against wood, but gradually it grows louder and more persistent, echoing around the cabin. It's not just coming from one direction anymore. It's as if the entire cabin is being encircled by these intermittent taps. The fireplace, which was burning brightly earlier, now flickers as if disturbed by an invisible draft. Every so often a cold gust of wind seems to move through the cabin, even though every door and window is firmly shut. Lucas, clutching his blanket, whispers, Why do the lights keep dimming? It's true. The lanterns that we've placed in the living room, which were filled with fresh oil, now burn with a weak, unsteady flame, plunging the room into sporadic darkness. Then Mia points towards one of the windows with a trembling hand. Pressed against the glass is a pale face, but as quickly as we all turn to look it vanishes, leaving only the reflection of the dim lanterns in our terrified faces. The atmosphere is thick with fear. Lisa suggests it's a brave attempt to inject some normality into the situation, but her voice trembles, revealing her own fear. But before we can even consider her suggestion, the front door, which we are sure was locked, slowly creaks open by itself. A cold wind rushes in, causing the flames in the fireplace to dance wildly. The room is filled with the scent of damp earth and something else, something metallic. Gathering my courage, I approach the door to shut it. As I near, I notice footprints on the cabin's wooden floor, wet, muddy footprints that lead to the children's room and then disappear. The realization hits hard. Whatever was outside is now, or was recently, inside with us. We need to stick together, I murmur, feeling the weight of the responsibility to protect my family. Other odd occurrences continue, whispers that seem to float in the air but are impossible to trace, items inexplicably moving from their original places, and a persistent feeling of being watched. The following morning, as breakfast dishes clatter softly, the mood is subdued. The events of the previous night loom over us, and I feel the need to change our surroundings, even if just for a bit. Pushing my plate away, I say, the woods might offer a nice distraction. Lisa hesitates, her gaze lingering on the kids. Are you sure? After last night? I nod. We can't let whatever that was keep us inside. Fresh air will do us good. With some reluctance, we bundle up and step outside. After a few minutes of walking, I realize something feels off. Do you hear that? The weight of the silence presses in, making my voice sound overly loud. Lisa stops beside me with a confused look on her face. Hear what? There's nothing. That's the point, I say, glancing around uneasily. It's too quiet. Lucas tugs at my sleeve. Why aren't the birds singing, Dad? Are they sleeping? I try to find an answer that'll make sense to his young mind. I'm not sure, buddy. Maybe they're just having a quiet day. As we continue our walk, the silence stays, amplifying the uncertainty from the night before and casting a shadow over our attempt to find solace in the beauty of nature. 
Eventually, we start to retrace our steps, but it's clear that everyone is more alert now. Lucas clutches my hand tightly. Dad, he whispers with his eyes wide, where are all the animals? Sometimes animals can be shy, especially when they hear people. Maybe we're just a bit too noisy for them today. Mia isn't convinced, but there's not even a bird in the sky, she points out, looking up at the treetops. Her observation is accurate. The clear blue sky above us is devoid of any flying creatures. Lisa attempts to divert their attention. How about a game? Let's see who can find the most unique leaf or twig on our way back. She bends down, picking up a strangely shaped twig as an example. For a moment, the children are distracted, excitedly searching the forest floor for their finds. Their laughter and chatter fill the air, offering a temporary break from the growing unease. I exchange a look with Lisa, appreciating her effort. But as we continue our journey back to the cabin, I can't shake the feeling of being watched. I keep scanning the woods, expecting to catch a glimpse of a deer or even another person. But there's nothing. The forest feels empty. By the time we reach the cabin, our earlier enthusiasm has evaporated. The promise of lunch and the safety of the cabin walls seem more inviting than ever. Maybe later we can try exploring in a different direction. Everyone agrees, and as we enter the cabin, there's a collective sigh of relief. After lunch, I feel the need for a moment of solitude. I decide to head out to the car to grab a tool I remember leaving in the trunk. The idea of maybe fixing a few things around the cabin could serve as a productive distraction. As I approach the vehicle, something feels off. It looks just as we left it, but then small details begin to emerge. The driver's side door is slightly ajar, not wide open, but just enough to be noticeable. I'm certain I locked it. I open the door cautiously, half expecting to find something wrong inside. However, everything seems in order. I decide to start the car, just to be sure. Turning the key in the ignition, the engine sputters but doesn't catch. I try again, the same result. My heart sinks. An unsettling thought takes root. The night's events, the eerie silence of the forest, and now this. I pop the hood in a quick survey. Doesn't reveal anything blatantly out of place, but I notice a few wires loosely hanging, not completely detached, but enough to prevent the car from starting. A chill runs down my spine. This is no accident. Determined. I decide to assess the damage further. With the right tools, maybe, just maybe, I can fix it. But it's clear to me now, someone or something doesn't want us to leave just yet. As I head back to the cabin, I'm torn. I don't want to alarm Lisa and the kids, but they deserve to know. Mia spots me first, her sharp eyes catching the concern on my face. She asks, her voice tinged with worry. Taking a deep breath, I say, the car's acting up, but I think I can fix it, just a minor hiccup. Lisa approaches with a questioning look in her eyes. Is everything okay? I nod, trying to sound reassuring. It's just a small issue, don't worry about it. We all head back inside, but the unspoken tension remains. As afternoon transitions to evening, I work tirelessly on the car while Lisa engages the kids in games, trying to keep their spirits up. Despite our best efforts, an undercurrent of fear runs through everything. As night approaches, the decision weighs heavily on us. We'll stay one more night, I declare. Tomorrow, we'll figure out our next move. The sun dips below the horizon, casting the world in darkness once more. As afternoon transitions to evening, I work tirelessly on the car. I'm no mechanic by any means, but I'm doing what I can. Meanwhile, Lisa engages the kids in games, trying to keep their spirits up. She leads them in a series of light-hearted activities, from card games to drawing sessions. It's a warm and necessary distraction from the growing unease surrounding us. Despite our best efforts, an undercurrent of fear runs through everything. The kids try to immerse themselves in play, yet I can see the shadow of worry in their youthful eyes. When dinner time comes around, our meal is subdued. Conversation tries to veer toward happy topics, yet it's consistently interrupted by long silences. As night approaches, the decision weighs heavily on us. The ticking clock seems louder, a relentless reminder of the time slipping away in the impending night. We'll stay one more night, I declare, my voice trying to bear the weight of conviction. Tomorrow, we'll figure out our next move. I try to instill a sense of hope, 
but in the pit of my stomach, unease churns, mixing with a stubborn determination to protect my family at all costs. Outside, the sun dips below the horizon, casting the world in darkness once more. The night outside is eerily quiet, amplifying every sound within the cabin. As we gather around the fireplace, a sudden cold gust of wind sweeps through despite all the windows and doors being firmly shut. It makes the flames sputter for a moment before they stabilize. Just as we start to settle down, a low, drawn-out scraping sound resonates from the side of the cabin. It's as if someone or something is slowly dragging a heavy object along the outer walls. Before we can process this, a series of soft, deliberate taps comes from the windows. It's not the chaotic pattern of rain or tree branches. These taps are methodical, almost curious. I rise, moving cautiously to one of the windows to investigate. But as I pull back the curtain, I met with only the darkness of the woods. Mia trying to mask her fear whispers, it's just the woods playing tricks on us, right? Her attempt at bravery is commendable, but the tremor in her voice is evident. Lucas, burying his face into Lisa's side, clutches her tightly. As the night drags on, other inexplicable occurrences plague us. The sound of faint, distant laughter drifts in, carried by the wind, chilling in its lack of source or reason. Every time we think the disturbances have ended, a new one begins, ensuring our anxiety remains at its peak. After a night of restless sleep, the morning sun shines through the curtains, but its warmth does little to alleviate the chill of fear that has settled in our bones. Lucas is the first to stir, his sleepy eyes opening to take in the dim room. Is it over? He asks, his voice shaking. I pull him close. It's morning, buddy. We're okay. Mia is curled up beside Lisa, her face buried in the crook of her mother's arm. I don't like this place anymore, she mumbles, her words muffled. Lisa strokes Mia's hair, her eyes meeting mine. We share a moment of silent understanding. We need to get out of here. But first we need to know what we're up against. Let's have breakfast, Lisa suggests, her voice deliberately cheerful. Then we can decide what to do. The act of preparing food is oddly comforting. The familiar sounds of sizzling and the aroma of cooking give us a momentary escape. But the unease is noticeable, hanging in the air like a dense fog. After eating, I suggest we take another look outside. The cabin feels confining and maybe a change of scene will help. But as we step out, that suffocating silence greets us again. No birds chirping, no rustle of leaves, just an oppressive stillness. Why is it so quiet, Mia whispers, her voice carrying in the expanse of the silent forest. Before I can answer, a soft thud from behind makes us all turn. A small stone lies at the foot of the cabin door. I frown, looking around for the source, but there's no one in sight. Lisa's voice breaks through my concentration. Look, she exclaims, pointing towards the woods. For a brief moment, I think I see a shadow dart between the trees, but when I blink, it's gone. Throughout the day, more unexplainable events unfold. A stack of logs beside the fireplace rearranges itself. The reflection in the cabin window shows an unfamiliar landscape. Our food supplies seem to diminish faster than they should, as if some of it just vanishes. Lisa and I are on edge, exchanging worried glances. It's clear that something is very wrong with this place. By late afternoon, as we're trying to rally our spirits with a game of cards, Lucas suddenly freezes with his gaze fixed on the window. Who's that? He whispers. I follow his line of sight and my heart skips a beat. Staring right at us is a face. It's pale, almost translucent with hollow eyes. But as quickly as I spot it, it disappears. As night begins to fall, the realization sets in. We're trapped in this isolated cabin, surrounded by an unseen force with no immediate means of escape. We gather in the living room, forming a tight circle on the floor. The only light comes from the candles we've placed around us. Time seems to slow as the night deepens. An unidentifiable scratching sound starts from the cabin's far corner, dragging slowly and steadily towards us. The scratching intensifies, moving up the walls and circling around us. Suddenly, Lucas, pointing towards a window and whispers, Look! As our eyes turn, we see dozens of those pale, hollow-eyed faces staring at us, just as quickly as they appear. They vanish. The hours stretch on, punctuated by strange noises, whispers that seem to float in from nowhere, 
soft footsteps outside the cabin, and the sounds of laughter in the distance. It's as if the forest itself is alive, toying with us. The first rays of sunlight fill the room. I stir from a fitful sleep. I sit up and see that Lisa is already awake. She's gazing out the window, deep in thought. Lucas and Mia are on the floor, entangled in a mess of blankets. Morning, I whisper, my voice sounding hoarse. Lisa turns her head and gives a faint smile. Morning, she replies. We move in tandem, getting breakfast ready. As we eat our meal of cereal and milk, an idea forms in my mind. We need to find someone, another cabin maybe. Someone must live nearby who can help us. I propose, trying to sound more hopeful than I feel. Lisa nods, her fingers tapping anxiously on the table. Yes, we should explore further into the woods. We haven't gone deep enough. Gathering our strength, we pack some essentials and set out. The dense forest surrounds us, and the thick canopy above allows only specks of sunlight to pierce through. Every step is accompanied by the soft crunch of fallen leaves and twigs beneath our feet. The world outside the woods seems distant. The air carries a heavy sense of anticipation, as if the forest itself is holding its breath. After what feels like hours of walking through the thick foliage, an outline begins to take shape. It's the silhouette of a cabin. There. Mia's voice breaks the silence, her finger pointing excitedly towards the growing structure. A cabin! Hope courses through us, making our feet move faster. The promise of potential safety or assistance propels us forward. The cabin slowly comes into clearer view, revealing its details. The wooden logs it's constructed from, the moss growing on its northern side, even the lone swing hanging from a tree nearby. But as we continue our approach, an eerie sense of deja vu grips me. Those chipped paint patches on the door, the slightly tilted mailbox, the pattern of the curtains. It dawns on me with an unsettling clarity. This is our cabin. Somehow in this vast forest we've ended up right back where we started. I stop in my tracks, feeling as if the ground has shifted beneath me. Lisa looks at the cabin and her face turns pale. How is this possible? The disbelief in her voice is palpable. We made sure to walk straight. Upon realizing we've circled back to our own cabin, a heavy silence falls over us. We stand still, taking in the eerie familiarity of our surroundings. For a moment, everything seems suspended, as if time itself is hesitating. As we step into the cabin, the weight of our situation becomes even more pressing. We decide to ration our remaining food and water, ensuring we have enough to last us if our stay is prolonged. As the day progresses, we work on fortifying the cabin. The unsettling occurrences of the previous nights have left us on edge, and we need to feel safe. Lisa and I fashion makeshift weapons using kitchen utensils, while Mia and Lucas help by collecting large branches from outside. We reinforce the cabin doors and windows with whatever materials we find. The night begins to creep in, bringing with it a renewed sense of apprehension. The forest outside darkens and the sounds become more pronounced. The chirping of crickets, the distant hooting of an owl, and the occasional rustling of leaves. But these familiar sounds only heighten the awareness of the uncanny silence we noticed earlier. Dinner is a quiet affair. We sit around the table with the dim glow from a lantern illuminating our faces. The food provides little comfort, and our conversation is sparse. Every noise from the outside makes us jump. As darkness fully engulfs the woods, we gather in the main living area of the cabin, keeping the lights dim. We take turns keeping watch, straining our ears for any signs of movement outside. Lucas, struggling to keep his eyes open, eventually drifts off to sleep. Nestled between Lisa and me, Mia stays awake, her sharp eyes scanning the darkness outside. Hours seem to pass like days, each minute stretching out endlessly. The unease is palpable, and every creak of the cabin or rustle of the trees sends our hearts racing. It's going to be a long night. Throughout the night, the stillness is punctuated by unexpected noises. At one point, a soft tapping sound resonates from one of the windows, causing all of us to turn our heads sharply in its direction. There's nothing visible outside, but the tapping continues intermittently, almost as if someone or something is trying to gauge our reactions. Suddenly, a low mournful howl pierces the night air. It's neither a wolf nor any animal I recognize. 
The howl seems distant, but it echoes through the forest, creating an eerie harmony with the silence. Then another howl responds, this one is closer, and then another. It's as if the forest has come alive with these strange cries. Lisa pulls Lucas closer to her, covering his ears, attempting to shield him from the unnerving sounds. As the hours drag on, a thick fog begins to envelop the cabin. It seeps in from the forest, clouding the windows, and making the outside world appear as an opaque white blanket. The visibility reduces drastically and the world outside becomes a blur. The combination of the fog and the strange sounds keeps us on high alert. Every so often we can make out shadows moving through the mist, but it's impossible to discern their origin or intentions. After a night of restless sleep, the first light of dawn breaks over the horizon and casting a gentle glow that paints the sky with a mesmerizing blend of orange and pink. The dense fog that has blanketed the cabin and surrounding woods since last night starts to retreat slowly, revealing the tree line. This change in visibility stirs something within me, a feeling of hope and an idea. Taking a deep breath, I turn to face my family, who are gathered in the dimly lit living room. We need to move. Now, while we have the advantage of daylight, I assert, letting the weight of my words sink in. The morning's soft glow won't last, and neither can our time in this place. We can't stay trapped here, I add, my tone revealing a mix of determination and concern. Lisa nods in agreement. Every moment we wait, the odds stack against us. We have to act quickly. We quickly gather what we need and brace ourselves for the journey ahead. As we push forward through the forest, I pull out some twine and old shirts we had packed earlier. With swift hands, Lisa and I rip the shirts into strips. We decide on a system. Every few yards, one of us ties a piece of shirt to a tree using the twine, creating a clear marker. The aim is to ensure we don't end up retracing our steps unknowingly as we had before. The forest around us seems to pulse with life, yet the eerie silence continues. Every rustling leaf, every snapped twig makes our heads turn, our eyes scanning the area for signs of movement. After a couple hours, Mia suddenly points ahead. Look, she whispers, her voice tinged with a mix of excitement and caution. Squinting, I see it. A road. Relief washes over us. However, this moment of excitement is brutally short-lived. The familiar spine-chilling howl from the night pierces the air. It's the same haunting sound. Only now it's infused with what seems like anger or frustration, and worse, it sounds much closer than before. Adrenaline surges through me. Run, I shout. I grasp Lucas's hand tightly, pulling him along while Lisa takes Mia's hand and we sprint towards the road, desperate to reach safety before whatever is behind us catches up. The intensity of our sprint makes every breath feel like fire. Each inhale and exhale is synchronized with our pounding footsteps. The terrifying howls seem to chase us, echoing through the trees and urging us to move faster, not to look back. It's as if the forest itself wants to pull us back into its dark embrace. When the woods finally break open to reveal the road, the sight of an approaching truck feels like a beacon of hope. The blinding glare of its headlights momentarily stuns us, making us freeze in our tracks, and the scent of burning rubber fills the air as the truck skids to a stop just a few feet away. The door of the truck swings open and a man peers out. His face holds a mix of concern and curiosity. Need a lift? He shouts over the rumble of the truck's engine. His eyes dart briefly to the woods behind us, as if understanding the unspoken danger we're running from. Gratefully and with no time for formalities, we scramble into the truck's cabin. As the truck roars to life and begins to move, I risk a glance back at the forest from which we had just emerged. The trees, shrouded in shadows, appear almost menacing. I could swear I see fleeting movements, dark shapes that dart between the trunks, watching and waiting. But as the distance between us and the woods grows, those haunting images blur into the backdrop, becoming just another part of the landscape we're leaving behind. Hank's truck rumbles down the road. The rhythmic bounce feels somewhat soothing after the day's trauma. The interior of the truck is well-worn, with the leather seats cracked from years of use, and there's the smell of fresh hay and a hint of motor oil in the air. He occasionally glances our way, likely gauging our level of distress. As he begins to talk, there's a certain weight to Hank's words, indicating that our story isn't the first of its kind he's come across. There's old legends about that place, he adds, his voice rough but gentle. 
like sandpaper smoothed by time. Folks around here tend to avoid it, especially after sunset. After a while, we arrive at his farm. The sprawling expanse of Hank's farm is a contrast to the oppressive woods we left behind. Rolling fields, grazing cattle, and a gentle wind carrying the scent of blooming flowers. It's like stepping into another world. When we pull up to the farmhouse, a modest structure with white paint and a picket fence, Hank's dog, a loyal-looking German shepherd, bounds up to greet us with its tail wagging. There's a warmth here, an aura of peace that instantly puts us at ease. You're welcome to stay the night, Hank offers, gesturing towards the home. I've got spare rooms and you could use a good rest. Gratefully, we accept his offer. The house is a cozy haven filled with memories captured in framed photographs and the aroma of a home-cooked meal. Stew by the smell of it wafting from the kitchen. There's a comforting feeling here that makes the eerie events of the past few days seem surreal. That night, as we sit around Hank's wooden dining table, the golden glow from the overhead eat and share stories. Despite the horrors we've faced, the sound of laughter and the safety of the farmhouse help mend the frayed edges of our spirits. Outside, the soft hoot of an owl and the chirping of crickets serenade us. Wrapped in blankets, sipping on mugs of warm cocoa provided by Hank, we start to feel a sense of security we hadn't felt in days. And as we drift off to sleep in the soft beds of the farmhouse, the nightmares of the woods seem, at least for now, to be locked safely away. The year was 1993, and I was a college student home on summer break looking for adventure. I had spent the past three months cooped up in the campus library cramming for finals, and now that I had free time, I was itching to get outside and enjoy nature. Growing up in the suburbs, I never had many chances to really connect with the wilderness. After discussing options with some friends, I decided to go on a solo hiking trip out untamed country. Though my parents were worried about me hiking alone, I reassured them I would be safe and stick to marked trails. I had my sights set on Washington State and the rugged Cascade Mountains after hearing they offered some of the most spectacular hiking in America. At 22 years old, I had backpacked before in the Appalachians. But the idea of pitting myself against the grand scale of the Pacific Northwest wilderness, I wanted to push my limits and endurance while enjoying alpine meadows, deep forests, and panoramic vistas. I had only seen on postcards. My planning started months in advance as I poured over topographic maps of the Cascades region and read trail guides. I decided June would be the perfect time to go after the snow melted and before the crowds arrived in summer. I packed my trekking gear, first aid kit, and and freeze-dried food for the journey west. After several long days of driving, I arrived in a small town situated right near the foothills of the North Cascades. The town was little more than a main street, a few restaurants and shops, and a basic motel where I checked in for the night. Beyond the town limits, the wilderness began, craggy, snow-dusted peaks stretching off into the distance. That night I could barely sleep, tossing with excitement about the hike ahead. At dawn, I loaded up my reliable Subaru station wagon and hit the road toward the mountains. I reached the trailhead by mid-morning, the alpine air clean and crisp. Slipping on my pack stuffed with gear and supplies, I took a deep breath, gazing up at the granite cliffs ahead. I was ready for this adventure. The first couple days of hiking were moderate but breathtakingly beautiful. I followed marked trails, passing cascading waterfalls that rainbowed in the sunlight. Thick forests of pine and fir towered like cathedrals, and I breathed deep the scent of earth and moss. At night I pitched my tent at established campsites, unwinding sore muscles next to a crackling fire as owls hooted in the darkness beyond. By day three I branched off onto less popular trails, wanting to experience the backcountry. The only souls I encountered were the occasional deer, badger, marmot, or other wildlife. My muscles burned and ached, climbing steep inclines and fording cold mountain streams. But the payoff was endless ridgeline vistas looking out over the rumpled landscape unfolding for miles. The feeling of being a tiny speck amid such epic grandeur was powerful. My worries and burdens of everyday life sloughed away mile by mile. I was humbled by the ancient forces that sculpted this land carving valleys and raising peaks. At night, watching meteor showers streak overhead, I'd never felt more connected to nature. 
After nearly two weeks of hiking, I was approaching the high alpine region. The air grew thinner and the views more breathtaking with each step. Late one afternoon, I climbed a switchback ridge trail that left me winded. An unbelievable sight stretched before me. A pristine alpine meadow sprawled, dotted with wildflowers, fiery Indian paintbrush, sunbursts of columbine, and purple lupine nodding in the breeze. Snow-capped monoliths loomed in the distance like silent sentinels rimming this hidden valley. Through the middle burbled a crystalline river, catching the dipping sun and glints of gold. I quickly set up camp right there rather than lose a minute of daylight to enjoy it. I set up my tent, built a fire ring with nearby stones, and cooked a freeze-dried dinner as the setting sun cast a pink glow. This was the kind of raw, untouched beauty I had longed for. As darkness fell, I layered up against the chill and reclined on a flat rock, gazing up at the sea of stars above. I curled up in my sleeping bag soon after stargazing, the chill night air seeping through the nylon tent, but I slept deeply and soundly in the alpine stillness, only awakened once by the eerie hoot of an owl piercing the night. Morning arrived slowly, the first glow of dawn barely penetrating the depths of the valley. I emerged from my tent, shivering, the meadow grass crunchy with frost. Taking my camp stove and pan down to the riverbank, I boiled water for instant coffee as I watched the sunlight creep down the rocky crags, slowly bringing warmth back to the valley. Sipping the hot coffee, I planned my route for the day, consulting my maps. I decided to follow the river upstream as far as possible, deeper into the back country. The lure of uncharted terrain pulled at me. My pack now felt feather-light after two weeks of conditioning my muscles and shedding any unnecessary weight. I was ready to cover some serious miles. After breakfast, I went about breaking down camp and repacking my gear with the efficiency of routine. Tent stakes and guy lines coiled neatly, sleeping bag compressed into its sack, clothes and food packed strategically. I stamped out the remains of my fire and scattered the ashes. Slinging on my pack, I took a last sweeping view of the meadow. Then I headed off, following the meandering course of the river. The first miles were easy going, the valley bottom relatively flat and grassy, but soon the walls closed in as I entered a narrow gorge. The terrain turned rockier, sometimes necessitating boulder hopping or bushwhacking through thickets choking the shoreline. When the underbrush became impassable, I simply waded through the frigid knee-deep water. I continued at a brisk pace with only occasional breaks to sip water and re-energize with handfuls of trail mix. My legs had grown lean and toned after days of mountain trekking, propelling me forward. Thoughts of graduate school, career, and other future obligations back home couldn't have felt farther away out here. By early afternoon, the gorge opened up into another valley. Not as spectacular as yesterday's flowered meadow, but still breathtaking. Golden light filtered through the trees, dappling the forest floor. Across the valley, I could see where the river emerged from between two imposing peaks. I felt drawn there tempted to see this river's source. But I knew it was too late in the day to attempt summiting those slopes. Reluctantly, I decided to call it a day. Spotting a clearing on the riverside, I chose a flat patch of grass sheltered by pines to make camp. The familiar tasks soothed me as I gathered kindling and cleared the ground for my tent. Soon I had a modest fire crackling and was savoring another meal of instant rice and beans as the valley darkened. The exertion of the day's hike caught up with me. I journaled briefly by firelight, chronicling the day's sights. I doused the fire until only glowing embers remained. Crawling into my tent, I was lulled to sleep by the soft roar of the river nearby. Tomorrow I would venture into those peaks to find the river's source. But that night I dreamt only of the open trail ahead, carrying me deeper into the wild unknown. Where the path would lead I couldn't say, but some innate pull told me to keep following it, step by step, mile by mile. I awoke with the first light of dawn. Despite the long day yesterday and a restful sleep, my legs felt restless and eager to get back on the trail. I wolfed down a breakfast of oatmeal and dried fruit, chasing it with bitter instant coffee. The familiar routine of breaking camp invigorated me as I efficiently packed up my gear. Soon I was back on the path, picking my way along the river's edge. My pace was brisk, breathing deep in the crisp morning air scented with pine resin. The towering peaks drew steadily nearer as I hiked. 
Surrounding trees gradually gave way to steep rocky slopes filled with boulders and scrubby brush. I continued hiking until midday when I came across a curious sight. There among a collection of cedar trees sat a dilapidated structure that appeared to be an old fire lookout tower. I approached cautiously through the underbrush for a better look. The tower stood two stories tall, boards gray and weathered. Glass was missing from the observation deck windows and the entire thing listed slightly to one side. I glanced at my topographic map, but saw no indication of any structures out here. When was it built and by whom? And why place a watchtower out here miles from the nearest road or town? My innate curiosity compelled me to take a closer look and find out more. Circling the base, I found the metal rungs of a fixed ladder still intact, leading up to the lower observation deck. Though rickety with age, the ladder seemed stable enough still to support my weight. I decided to climb up to get a view of the surrounding landscape from above. Maybe I'd spot some other remnants or ruins in the area. I cautiously tested my weight on the first few rungs. They held firm, with only a bit of creaking. I began making my way up the ladder slowly, keeping a firm grip. I imagined the long-ago fire spotters scrambling up nimbly on their daily watch. As I ascended past the lower deck, getting higher above the trees, I felt the old, familiar thrill of being up high with a bird's-eye vantage. But nearing the top I started to feel strange, almost watched. The surrounding forest seemed too quiet and still. I shook off the ominous feeling, chalking it up to the tower's dilapidated state. Pulling myself up the last few rungs, I hoisted myself gingerly onto the upper observation deck. Up here, the full extent of the tower's disrepair became clear. The wooden floorboards were cracked and crumbling, with areas completely remnants of the panoramic windows. Stepping carefully to avoid weak spots, I walked the perimeter of the deck. The sweeping views of craggy ridges and dense forest now opened up just as I had hoped. But as I peered closer at the tower itself, details emerged that filled me with growing unease. Strange stains that looked disturbingly like old dried blood splattered the inner walls, and gouged into the wooden planks were numerous deep scratches and gashes. The chaotic claw marks looked far too aggressive to be from any animal. My mind raced with what could have caused such violent and eerie damage. I shuddered as I imagined some horrific scene of desperation and carnage that must have played out here long ago. As much as the mystery piqued my curiosity, a powerful instinct told me to get out of there. The watchtower that had seemed merely abandoned now felt ominous, almost foreboding. The shadows inside seemed to hold some deeper darkness. I weighed whether to turn back, but the explorer in me hungered to unravel the clues and better understand what had happened in this lonely tower. I still had sunlight left to keep looking around. Ignoring my unease, I resolved to stay a little longer and see what else I could discover. I peered closer at the gashes. Kneeling down, I examined more closely the brownish stains, smelling the unmistakable iron scent of old blood. What terrified struggle had led to such carnage? As I studied the claw marks, I convinced myself some wild animal must be to blame, perhaps a rogue grizzly. There was surely some rational explanation behind it all but the isolated watchtower still felt heavy with a lingering darkness. The shadows seemed to be growing longer, though it was only mid-afternoon. Despite my desire for answers, I finally had to admit it was time to head back down before I lost daylight. I wasn't thrilled about climbing down the ladder in darkness. Lingering dread compelled me towards the hatch. Stepping gingerly around broken glass and debris, I walked the perimeter of the deck. Through the shattered windows, an impressive panorama opened up of the surrounding forested valley, topped by rocky outcroppings. The afternoon sun cast long shadows between the trees below. I gazed out at the endless expanse, happy to have reached this bird's-eye vantage point. But this far from civilization, a sense of isolation weighed on me. The only sounds were the wind gusting through the trees and the lonely cries of hawks circling above. I was about to turn back toward the ladder when a sudden noise from the forest below froze me in my tracks. A deep guttural growl rumbled up from the trees, echoing around the valley walls. The sound seemed to vibrate through my core, setting my heart racing. Gripping the window frame for balance, I desperately scanned the trees below, searching for the source. My eyes landed on a dark shape lurching among the shadows under the firs. 
nothing like a bear or mountain lion. Details were obscured by brush and distance, but the figure appeared massive and almost humanoid, walking upright on two legs. Paralyzing terror seized me as I watched it approach the base of the tower. This was no ordinary forest creature. It began to climb the tower's weathered ladder toward me. I stood frozen in fear and disbelief at the nightmarish scene unfolding. The creature's limb proportions were human-like, yet its movements were utterly inhuman. Soon it would reach me, and I was completely exposed here on the open deck with nowhere to run or hide. With my heart thundering in my ears, I watched helplessly as it drew nearer. The wood framing creaked under its weight as if it could rip the tower apart. I teetered on the edge of outright hysteria and had to stifle an urge to scream. But some primal part of me knew that could provoke the thing to attack faster. Only halfway up the ladder and already the creature's stench reached me, an awful mix of mud and decaying flesh. I gagged at the putrid smell, eyes watering. Still my muscles refused to respond, refusing to flee in blind panic. I stood rooted in place. The creature had now almost reached the lower observation deck, just ten feet below me. I could hear its rattling breaths along with the scrape of claws on wood. Details of its appearance began coming into focus through the haze of dread. Skin gray and rough like moldy bark, a muscular frame that seemed ready to burst through its filthy, tattered clothing. But its face was what seared into my mind, a hairless, twisted caricature of a human face with sightless white orbs for eyes and a mouth of jagged, yellowing teeth. Those milky, unseeing eyes somehow conveyed a sinister intelligence, an insatiable hunger. My sanity strained to process what I was witnessing, but the putrid smell rooted me in the present. There would be no escape. I glimpsed the gnarled claws gouging into the wood of the final rung as it heaved itself onto the deck. There was nowhere left to run. Frantically, I scanned the deck for some means of escape, some route to evade the horror now cornering me. But the tower platform offered nowhere to hide from the humanoid beast. Rotted boards, broken glass, and a few feeble railings were my only surroundings. Escape would mean getting past the creature blocking my path to the ladder. I looked at the beast towering before me, well over seven feet tall. Powerful muscles rippled under its filthy skin. Even if I managed to dodge its gnarled grasp, its immense stride could easily catch me on the confined deck before I reached the hatch. My mind raced through hopeless scenarios of fighting back or pleading for mercy from a force clearly devoid of it. The creature seemed to be watching me with sinister patience, stopping its approach to let me struggle with futility. It was toying with me, I realized, relishing in my desperation. Slowly it began pacing the perimeter of the deck, between me and the only exit. I turned in a cautious circle, tracking it. A deep rumbling chuckle emanated from its cavernous chest as it herded me toward the broken window. Step by step it was backing me toward a lethal plummet. Inching backward, I frantically racked my mind for options. Trying to slip past and flee down the ladder would be suicide. The creature could easily grab me or knock me off the platform as I passed. I might be able to struggle briefly, but this beast could tear me apart limb from limb once it got hold of me. My only chance of escape, I saw with gut-wrenching clarity, was to jump from this towering height. But looking out at the forest floor forty feet below, I faltered. Either option would likely end with me dead or crippled at the base of the tower. I hesitated at the precipice, looking back at the creature as it drew within mere feet, toying with me like a cat with a cornered mouse. Up close, its twisted features and foul stench nearly made me wretch in fear. I closed my eyes, bracing myself. As it reached for me, I leaped over the railing into the open air. For a few dizzying seconds I was weightless, the wind roaring in my ears. I had a brief glimpse of branches rushing upward before colliding brutally with the rocky earth. Searing pain shot through my left leg and hip as I slammed down hard and tumbled over roots and underbrush. Only adrenaline allowed me to scramble to my feet. My left leg buckled under me when I tried to limp forward, but fueled by terror, I hobbled frantically toward the trees. Behind me, the monster's shrieks of rage rang out as it thundered back down the tower ladder. I made it just to the tree line before my leg gave out and I collapsed. Crawling now on elbows and one knee, I somehow kept dragging myself forward, weaving between the pines for cover. The creature's enraged roars shook the forest as it closed in behind me. 
I had to get as far from the watchtower as possible before the monster recaptured my scent. Branches tore at my clothes and skin, but I barely felt the cuts and scratches. Adrenaline allowed me to scramble a few more feet and disappear into the underbrush before everything went dark. When I came to, the forest was silent. My legs still blazed with pain, but the scream of panic driving me on was gone. As my wits slowly returned, I dared to hope I might live to see another sunset, but I had to keep moving. Gritting my teeth, I leaned on a branch and staggered deeper into the woods, one step at a time. The creature's enraged roars still rang in my ears, though the forest now appeared empty around me. I must have dragged myself here in a semi-conscious panic before collapsing, but I knew the thing from the tower could return any moment to pick up my trail. I had to move. Gritting my teeth, I pulled myself upright using a tree branch, barely able to put weight on my injured leg. Hobbling and stumbling, I started weaving between the pines as quickly as I could manage. My progress was slow and halting, but I was desperate to get distance from that cursed watchtower and the nightmare creature I had glimpsed there. The terrain was rough, forcing me to scramble over rocks and fallen logs. I used saplings and branches as crutches to keep from falling. The jarring pain that shot through my leg with each step soon had me slick with cold sweat, but terror drove me to maintain a frantic, lurching pace. As I half ran, half staggered through the trees, the creature's distant roars reached me. The tower was far behind me now, but the thing had picked up my trail and was pursuing me through the forest. The guttural bellows and crashing branches came from somewhere behind, seemingly growing closer with each passing minute. Panic surged through me, lending strength to my aching muscles and numbed limbs. I no longer felt the cuts and scrapes from the underbrush whipping my arms and face. A singular purpose consumed me to get as far away as possible from the hellish entity hunting me down. I scrambled on, crashing heedlessly through the understory. But the adrenaline that had fueled my flight soon began wearing off. As terror's spell wore down, my legs started throbbing relentlessly. The simple act of walking now became excruciating as the pain mounted. I could only hobble slowly, weaving and stumbling like a drunkard. Each glancing blow or stubbed toe was blinding agony. Progress slowed to a limping crawl. My clumsy footfalls and gasping breath sounded thunderously loud, betraying my location. Glancing back, I still saw no sign of the creature. But its enraged bellows continued at a steady volume, neither gaining nor losing distance. The thing was tracking me unerringly through the winding woods. I knew I had to keep moving or resign myself to being torn limb from limb by that hideous monstrosity. Mustering my last dregs of strength and will, I forced my maimed leg onward. I was running on pure desperation now, ignoring my own suffering. If I could just break the creature's line of sight, I might be able to hide and evade it. The forest floor flew by in a blur of pain and panic. My heart pounded in my ears, drowning out all other sounds. Just when I thought my body could take no more, a distinct cracking of branches came from somewhere behind and to my left. The thing was nearby now, closing in. My time was quickly running out. My leg was on fire, each step was sheer torment but I pushed through the pain, staggering between trees and underbrush. The creature sounded terrifyingly close now, its snarls and heavy footfalls closing in through the forest. I risked a panicked glance behind me as I fled. Through the trees I caught the large form barreling toward me, moving with uncanny speed for its massive size. It was only a hundred yards back, smashing through saplings and shrubs. Seeing the thing galvanized my survival instinct. I scrambled on faster, my breath now coming in ragged sobs. Frantically I searched for somewhere, anywhere to hide and break its line of sight. But the woods here offered little cover, just thin trunks and low ferns that would conceal nothing. The creature's panting breaths seemed just behind me as I dashed and wove between the trees. Then suddenly I stumbled into a small clearing and saw a massive fallen oak, its trunk hollow and barrel-shaped. I limped to it without hesitation collapsing to my knees and crawling inside feet first. I pulled my pack in behind me and scooted deeper into the logs sheltering darkness. The space was tight, with room only to lay flat on my back. Outside, I could hear the thing crashing closer until it sounded like it was right on top of me. Holding my breath, I peered through a small hole in the bark, my heart in my throat. 
Seconds later, I saw the creature's feet stride into view, so close I could have reached out and touched them. The rotten stench preceding it made me gag. The thing stopped mere yards from my hiding spot. It turned in a slow circle, nose raised to the air, inhaling loudly. Good God, it was sniffing me out. I lay paralyzed, praying the earthy, damp, rot smell of the log would mask my scent. For endless minutes the monster paced around the log, so close I could hear the scrape of its claws and deep rumble in its throat. My nerves frayed near the breaking point as I waited, but somehow the thing lost my scent trail. With an enraged howl, it turned and retreated the way it had come back toward the watchtower. I remained huddled in the cramped log, hardly daring to breathe as the sounds of its passage faded. Only once the forest was silent again did I risk creeping from my hiding spot. My injured leg had stiffened during the tense wait, making it even harder to walk now. But with the creature gone, at least briefly, I had to keep moving. Blinking in the late afternoon sunlight, I continued, ears straining for any sign of pursuit. The creature's frustrated cries still rang out far behind me. It seemed to be following my original trail back toward the tower. But I knew it was only a matter of time before it picked up my path again. I had to make the most of this chance to get away. I pressed on. Each awkward stumbling step took me farther from that unspeakable evil and brought me closer to survival. As the light faded, I walked from shadow to shadow. The shadows lengthened as afternoon faded into dusk. I had managed to evade the creature, but now found myself stumbling, lost and exhausted through the darkening woods. The towering pines and firs closed around me, leaving only faint ribbons of orange sky visible overhead. My leg throbbed relentlessly, making each halting step an ordeal. Gouges and scratches from the underbrush covered my arms and face. Fear and pain left me lightheaded and gasping, but I knew I couldn't stop. To rest even for a moment was to risk the creature catching my scent again. As night fell, the trees became a disorienting black maze. With no moon or stars yet visible, I was engulfed in darkness. I clung desperately to the vague hope I was heading west, toward some kind of road or help. But in truth, I had no idea if I was going in circles or even heading deeper into the wild backcountry. The monster could be a hundred yards behind me or still prowling miles back at the abandoned tower. There was no telling. Each step was now a monumental effort of will. Blindly, I blundered over rocks and fallen logs, bruising and lacerating myself further. My head spun with pain and exhaustion. The darkness around me seemed to be closing in, suffocating. Some primal part of me wanted nothing more than to collapse to the ground and surrender to oblivion. But I forced that bleak impulse down, dredging up some last reserve of strength. To give in to despair and pain would mean final defeat. So I soldiered on, limping and groping through the blackness. Somewhere there had to be help or refuge. I just had to endure and keep searching. Time lost meaning as I became a creature of pure survival instinct, consumed only by putting one foot in front of the other. A dense fog of pain obscured all else, before halting my reckless advance. Teetering there, I swayed, about to black out from exhaustion and suffering. As I lingered on the brink of collapse, the wind changed, carrying the faint scent of wood smoke. I blinked, peering into the darkness. Somewhere ahead, just visible between the trees, was the subtle glow of firelight. Hope flickered back to life within me. I staggered directly toward that beacon in the growing darkness. Minutes or hours later, I limped into a clearing housing a small campsite. Figures moved in surprise around a campfire. I had never seen a more beautiful sight. Hardly believing my luck, I called out hoarsely to the blurred shapes. My voice was weak and rasping after hours without water. As I approached, a man and woman jumped up, staring in alarm at my disheveled, bloody form emerging from the darkness. Help! I croaked before collapsing to my knees. They hesitated, then hurried over to support me. Oh my God, are you okay? The woman asked. She looked about thirty, dressed in hiking clothes, her face showing with concern. The man just stared, wide-eyed. What happened to you, he said. You look like you barely survived a bear attack. I shook my head, wincing at the pain in my leg. Not a bear, I gasped. There's something else, some kind of creature out there. The couple exchanged an uneasy glance, clearly doubtful. Here, let's get you warmed up first, the woman said gently. They helped me over to sit by the campfire. 
Its warmth was heavenly after hours spent stumbling and lost in darkness. The man handed me his canteen and I gulped the water desperately. I'm Katie, by the way, the woman said. This is my husband, Matt. I'm James. Thank you. I thought I was done for out there. Matt examined my mangled leg, his brow creasing. This looks bad. It might be broken. I've got a first aid kit. Let me patch you up. As he wrapped the swollen limb in a tensor bandage, I described the watchtower and the ghastly creature that had pursued me. Katie's eyes widened, but Matt looked skeptical. No offense, man, but that sounds crazy. Maybe you hit your head or got lost and imagined this... thing, he said. I grabbed his arm, meeting his eyes intently. I know what I saw. It was real, and it's still out there hunting me. They exchanged another worried look. Just then, a distant howl echoed through the trees, seeming to vibrate the ground itself. Matt and Katie both jumped. The animalistic roar rose and fell again. No natural creature made a sound like that. What the hell was that? Matt said, panicked. Katie turned to me, all doubt gone from her face now. Okay, we believe you. We need to get out of these woods now. They began quickly packing gear into their backpacks while I gulped more water. As they kicked dirt over the fire, the beast's cries sounded again, closer now. Fear clawed at my gut. With Matt supporting me, we hurried from the campsite toward a nearby dirt road where their truck was parked. My leg blazed with pain, but I pushed on, propelled by terror. The cries were growing steadily louder behind us. Katie threw the packs in the truck bed and leaped into the driver's seat. Tires spun and sent up a rooster tail of gravel as she floored the gas pedal. We swerved onto the road and sped away just as a massively inhuman shape jumped out of the trees behind us. Matt and I stared wide-eyed at each other. The creature's enraged roars faded away as we fled. My head swam with relief. We had made it out. Matt's truck bounced down the dirt road, carrying us away from the howls behind us. My body ached and my head swam, but I felt overwhelming relief to be escaping that cursed forest. After driving in shaken silence for a while, Katie spoke up. James, where are you staying? We can take you to the nearest hospital to get checked out. I hesitated. Now that the immediate terror had passed, I just wanted to get home. I couldn't bear trying to explain everything to doctors or police right now. They'd think I was crazy or delusional from injury. I'd rather you just drop me at my hotel if that's okay. I need to clean up and rest. Matt and Katie exchanged a worried glance but didn't argue. We soon reached the outskirts of the small mountain town where I was staying. Pulling into the motel parking lot, Matt helped me hobble to my door. Take care, man. Seriously, go see a doctor, he said. I thanked them for the rescue. Once inside, I collapsed onto the bed, utterly spent. My leg was swollen and caked with dirt and blood from the fall. My arms and face stung with dozens of cuts and abrasions but somehow, miraculously, no bones seemed broken. With great effort, I limped to the bathroom and cleaned my wounds in the shower. The cuts burned under the hot water and soap, but it felt good to wash off the forest grime. After drying off, I swallowed some painkillers and bandaged the deeper gashes. Though exhausted, I knew sleep would be impossible with my nerves still frayed. I brewed a pot of strong coffee, wanting to stay awake. I flipped aimlessly through TV channels, trying to distract my racing mind. But despite my efforts, horrific visions of the creature kept intruding. Its twisted face and white eyes haunted me each time I blinked. I could almost smell its fetid stench and hear its rumbling breath nearby. Somehow I must have dozed off eventually because I jerked awake, crying out from another nightmare of being pursued through the dark woods. Heart pounding, I fumbled for the bedside lamp. Pale morning light filtered through the curtains. The night had passed uneventfully, though my nerves felt as raw as ever. Over the next few days, paranoia and bad dreams consumed me. I hardly slept, jumping at the smallest creak or thump from neighboring rooms. Though the creature was miles away, I couldn't shake the feeling it was coming for me, tracking my scent. I knew I should tell someone, the police, rangers, anyone, about the thing menacing the woods. But deep down, I understood how absurd it would sound. They'd think the trauma and blood loss had made me imagine the whole ordeal. No one would believe such a nightmarish creature could be real. So I kept silent, staying barricaded in my room. 
I stopped contacting friends and family, afraid they'd see how unhinged I had become. I avoided other motel guests, making only brief midnight supply runs to the deserted lobby. I knew I couldn't go on living this way, yet saw no way to return to normality. The woods had broken something in me, leaving me a paranoid mess. I spent the next week holed up in my motel room, curtains drawn. The creature's gnarled face haunted my dreams each night, and every creak or car door slam made me flinch. Certain it was coming for me, my best friend Mark called daily, worried by my sudden silence. Each time I let it go to voicemail, too ashamed to explain my panicked state. But after a week I finally answered. James, thank God I've been so worried about you, Mark said. What happened? Where did you go? I hesitated. Sorry, the hiking trip was more intense than I expected. I'm fine. Just needed some rest. Mark didn't sound convinced. Well, I'm glad you're okay, but you're clearly not fine. Talk to me, man. Really, I'm all right. I lied. My phone died and then I got sick. But I'm feeling better now, just tired. We spoke a while longer before I made an excuse to hang up, promising to call him soon. My chest ached with loneliness and shame, but I couldn't bear to tell anyone what I had experienced. My mom also called repeatedly, demanding to know why I wasn't answering. Each time I fed her the same weak story, promising I'd visit home soon. Though doubtful, she reluctantly accepted my lies, making me swear to take care of myself. But I wasn't taking care of myself at all. I hardly ate, stopped shaving, and showered only occasionally. At night, every branch scrape on the window or creak of the floorboards shot adrenaline through my system. Sleep brought only terrors of the creature dragging me back into its lair. I knew my anxiety and seclusion weren't healthy or sustainable. I had to rejoin the world at some point or accept a life consumed by trauma. But even venturing outside to get the mail made my heart race. I remained endlessly vigilant for a hulking shadow stalking me from the trees. Nearly a month after my hiking trip, I finally recognized I had to get help before I self-destructed. I still couldn't tell anyone the full truth, but clearly I was deeply scarred by something that happened in those woods. I decided to find a therapist and start working through my intense anxiety. I had to stop hiding from life and fight to regain some happiness and normalcy. The creature couldn't take that from me unless I let it. I still double-checked the locks each night and kept a light on. Images of that awful twisted face sometimes woke me from restless sleep. But slowly, day by day, I was getting better. Letting go of shame, I started reconnecting with friends and family. Though I knew the memories would never leave me completely, I refused to surrender everything to that unspeakable darkness. It's been over twenty years now since that fateful hiking trip. Two decades spent trying to make sense of the horrors I witnessed in those remote Washington woods. Time has dulled the bone-chilling fear I felt back then. But there are still nights when snippets of the ordeal flash through my mind, jolting me awake in a cold sweat. During the first few years afterward, those memories were a constant torment. That twisted, inhuman face stalked my dreams and lingered at the edge of my vision while awake. Simple shadows would conjure images of the creature coming for me. I jumped at every creak and bump, hyper-vigilant that it had returned to finish what it started. My personality and outlook changed, too. Where once I was outgoing and adventurous, I became withdrawn and timid, afraid to leave the safety of home. I pushed away concerned friends and family, unable to articulate what I had experienced. Counseling helped temper the worst anxiety, but no therapist truly believed my account of an otherworldly forest monster. I can't blame them. It sounds absurd even to me now. For a long time, anger and shame festered in me over how that single encounter had stolen my health and happiness. I despised the person I had become, paranoid, broken, haunted. At my lowest points, I considered taking my own life, just to be free of the endless trauma. That horrific encounter took so much from me for so long, but by moving forward each day with purpose, compassion, and hope, I take back what is most precious, a life lived vibrantly and unafraid. Though the darkness may haunt the far corners, it cannot dim my spirit unless I allow it. After enduring the worst it could inflict, I now know light always remains if we seek it.